take it away, Terry. Okay, great. Hi, thank you. Yes, and uh, it's my pleasure to sit down with Nick again and uh, and talk. It's always a, a wonderful and inspiring chat. So, um, you know, the the uh, the COVID pandemic uh, has changed everything for all of us, even the criminal element, right? Uh, it seems that they have even more opportunity to commit nefarious deeds and fraud. Um, that's why it's more important than ever that you traders and investors out there uh, take the matters into your own hands. And you need to stay on top of uh, the evolving tactics that these criminals use. And you also need to understand, probably more importantly, how to implement um, effective strategies to combat them. Um, so I am with, with Nick Prococo today, and he is, as you all probably know, uh, CSO at Kraken uh, Digital Asset. He has more than 23 years experience in information, uh, physical and product uh, security. Um, and he's responsible at Kraken for security, IT, and DevOps. And he was the C uh, CSO at Uptake. Um, and he's, you know, you might know him as the VP and founder of uh, Spider Labs. So I'm going to be quiet right now and let him speak for himself. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Terry? Nice to great, great to see you. Again. Yeah, it's good. So um, let's start with the, some of the basics here. How, how long have you been Kraken's uh, uh, chief security officer? And how has your career prepared you for this role? So I've been the chief security officer at Kraken um, for a little more than two years. Um, and I would say that I've been preparing for this role um, probably my whole life. I think I'm probably <laughs> maybe a unique, it's unique in the sense that um, I started working with technology at a very young age, um, self-taught programmer at, you know, age six, you know, age seven in the early 80s, and then um, really um, sort of cut my teeth in, you know, learning about security, um, even, even at a young age as well, um, hanging out in the BBSs, the bulletin board systems in Chicago, um, <laughs> reading hacker zines, um, participating in a lot of the chats in BBSs, um, you know, some famous BBSs known as like Temple of Pong and Lunatic Fringe and places like that. Um, and then, um, you know, throughout high school and in college um, was very deep into, you know, things like IRC, um, you know, hanging out in a lot of the channels in, in that world. I ran um, one of the EFNet IRC servers in college for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And then after college, um, really, you know, you know, went right into security, right? So that's, you know, that's where, you know, I started. Um, you know, doing things like firewall setups for companies back, you know, when I was in my early 20s, you know, flying around the country doing that, and then got into, you know, started utilizing, you know, the hacking skills that I had, um, had built up over the years to do things, which I, at one, at one point in my career, had no idea it was a real job, but getting paid <laughs> to basically break into companies, right, doing penetration right. testing. So yeah, so I've been doing that for a long time, um, did a lot of security research, um, spoke at places like DEF CON, um, founded a hacker conference in Chicago called ThoughtCon, um, you know, founded Sputter Labs where I ran a global organization of security researchers and pen testers and incident response. And I would say really, you know, where things, you know, the, the things that have helped me so, as most here at Kraken is probably the deep knowledge in one, penetration testing, two, the security research that I've done over the years, and then three, um, the, um, a lot of the incident response investigations, right? You know, I was involved in some of the most high profile data breaches and learned um, what those organizations, um, made, where those organizations made the wrong decisions along the path and be able to shape that and put some of those pieces into the programs and the, sec the security programs that I've built up, um, not only at Kraken, um, but also in my, in my previous roles as a chief security officer. Uh, did you find some commonalities in in those breaches and in the mistakes that people had made? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, for the most part, most, and I think this is maybe a misconception that people have, um, not only in the um, in the cryptocurrency industry um, or in the cryptocurrency community, but also in the world in general. Um, they often think about um, when they hear about a data breach, they're like, "Oh, this company X had a data breach and they lost all of this money or all this crypto or all of, you know these customer records." In their mind, they think of this like super advanced, you know, you know, zero day attack that happened at this company. Um, but I can tell you, after being involved in thousands of data breaches um, from an investigate from an investigator standpoint, that doesn't really happen. Usually, it is the very basic, low hanging fruit, um, easy to identify, easy to fix, um, easy to have policies around even. Um, you know, issues that exist, more systemic issues that exist within companies that lead to those data breaches. Um, it's very rare that it's this 
super advanced, you know, mega attacker, you know, type that type attack that takes place where um, where it's you know where the company has was doing everything they should have or has a really you know robust security program and um, and someone gets past um, past the past the past the fortification that exists within their organization. It's usually the low hanging fruit type items um, that um, people that the companies fall victim to, and then also in people's personal lives, that's usually what happens as well. Well, and you've told me before that the threats also are usually hiding in plain sight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, it, I mean, a lot has to do with visibility. I mean, we, we talk about that quite often um, here at Kraken um, within, our, within our organization, you know, having as much visibility into all of the places as possible is, is really key. Um, because if there are blind spots, whether it's in your personal life, um, in your own personal security posture, or in a, in a large enterprise, if there are blind spots that exist, um, that's where problems can lurk. Um, that's where you know systems can exist that people forgot about and haven't patched in you know several years. Or there's a you know a, a, an account on that system that has a very weak password associated with it that's on the internet, right? Things like that are where those things lurk. Where where if someone doesn't have visibility or the organization doesn't have visibility um, into everything that's that's out there from an attack vector standpoint, then, um, then you're sort of behind the eight ball um, in being able to defend and, um, and, and, and detect those types of attacks. Well, you know, you've also said too that, that organizations have a visibility problem. Why, why is that? Um, why does that persist? I, I mean, I think in many cases, it's sort of that, that, that struggle um, between, <laughs> um, between um, the business objectives of the company um, and, um, and, and the reality of what exists within the IT, within the DevOps groups, um, within the security teams, um, where the business is going a thousand miles an hour in one direction and the, the technical teams feel like they're trying to play catch up all the time. And it's very easy for something to just get jettisoned or left behind and, um, and have the mindset of, oh, we'll fix that someday, or we'll get to that, in, you know, we'll get, that in, get to that in a couple of months. In many organizations, you know, someday, a couple of months, um, it typically equates to never. Um, and I, you know, I work with my teams very often around that as well. You know, if we say, well, hey, maybe we'll do this next week, or maybe we'll do this in a month. No, that's, that's not really what we should be thinking, because we know, um, I know, I've seen this happen hundreds of times in organizations where it's very easy to put something off until tomorrow, um, and tomorrow basically never comes. Um, and people change over, there's different teams that come and play, and all of a sudden there's, there's infrastructure or there's technology that um, is basically this, basically forgotten. It's in like the land of forgotten toys, right? Um, <laughs> well, and not to mention uh, some friction between the business and security and development and security, correct? Um, are there some ways to ratchet that down? Yeah, I mean, I think it all comes down to you know, building security in. To the um, to the technology, right? So you know, mm -hmm. or into the into the engineering and the, and the development process, right? You know, that's something we we pride ourselves in here at here at Kraken, and that's something that we've been doing for a long time. Um, it's not as if there's something gets built and then someone, you know, and there's no security checks along the way. There's no security work happening, and then someone says, "Hey, we're we're going live with this product tomorrow. Can security check it out?" Like. Like many organizations operate that way. I've, I've advised and consulted with organizations yeah. um, in the past where that's the reality, um, but that's a problem, right? Anybody who's, who's at a security minded organization, who's at an organization that, that, um, that, that prides itself in security, that has a commitment to security, doesn't, doesn't let those, things type, those types of things happen. Okay, well, I've got one more question before we jump into um, some some stuff sp specific to um, crypto and also to COVID. Um, can you, um, I guess, let's lay a little groundwork uh, about the threat landscape and how things have sort of changed over the years since you've been doing this. Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, from my point of view, what what has really changed, um, you know, when you put on the the attacker hat, right? If I if I put on the attacker hat and I say I'm going to go after go after companies, I'm going to go after individuals. What has really changed over the years from, from when I first started, right, you know, 20 plus years ago, um, there weren't very many attack vectors back then. So even as a, as a, as a pen tester, right, when I was, you know, was doing pen test work, when I would target a company, um, right. it was basically the network attack vector, um, maybe a web application attack vector if they had a presence on the internet um, from, a, from a web application standpoint, like, any, like a shopping um, site or something like that, uh -huh. and maybe email. Right, like that was basically it. 
Um, today, um, we, can, we can spend five hours talking about the attack vectors um, that exist within, uh, within companies in the year 2020. Right? It's, it's, that's, that's, you know, as, a, as an attacker, I have a wide variety of ways that I can target an organization. And that, that's where it becomes difficult as a defender, because now you have lots of doors and windows to, to, to put some controls in place on, um, where 20 years ago, there might have just been four or five windows on the, uh, on the fort. Okay. Um, is securing Bitcoin the same as securing a bank account or other financial assets? No. I mean, that, that, that's, um, that's probably something that, you know, when we think about, you know, new people coming to, to the Kraken and, and creating accounts um, and, and getting into and getting into crypto and buying their first, um, first, first crypto or first Bitcoin, right? I think that's the paradigm shift um, that people really need to understand. Right. When, you, when, you're, when, you're, when you're taking the leap or you're, you're getting into crypto, you are essentially becoming your own bank um, <laughs> in, in many regards. Um, where in the traditional finance world, right, traditional finance world, as a consumer, you know, you know, I have a credit card and I have a checking account. You know, those two things that most people have, right? Their paycheck is deposited in their, right. in their checking account. And then they go and they buy stuff on credit cards and they pay that off, you know, every once in a while. Um, as a consumer, if someone steals my credit card, I really can care less, right? Like the, the, what happens when someone steals your credit card? It's a convenience, right? It's a, it's a convenience problem or it's an inconvenience where you now have look at your, your statement and you see there's like a few thousand dollars in charges. You got to call up the credit card company. You have to complain about it. You have to tell them that those charges aren't yours. They're going to take those charges off your card. You don't have any liability there. And then they're going to have to re, you know, recycle your number and give you a new card, right? So that's... Um, that's um, that's the, that's the reality there. And then on the bank account side, someone breaks into your bank account somehow, right? They get, you know, get a hold of your, your banking credentials um, or um, they social engineer your bank into giving them access to your account, something along those lines, and you lose several thousand dollars. Um, yeah. You know, you know you're, it's again an inconvenience, um, but you can call your bank and say, hey, I lost money. Someone, someone robbed me, right? Someone robbed the bank um, and someone stole that, um, stole that money from my account, right? That world, you know, there's, there's things like FDIC insurance and the things are insured and you can get your money back easily. Um, but in the crypto space, if you, um, if you have your, your crypto stored in your own wallet, right? If you have it, you know, you're following best practices and you store it in a hardware wallet and you store your, your seeds for that hardware wallet um, on, a, on, on, a, on a cloud drive and that cloud drive gets hacked into, and someone gets a hold of the seeds and they recreate your wallet, right? They basically restore your, those seeds to their own, to a criminal's wallet. And then they move all the crypto out of your wallet and you go to check your balance and there's zero. There isn't, you know, 1-800-Bitcoin-Bank that you can call. You can't call somebody to get that money back, right? And that's, right. The, that's the mindset that people um, really need to be in when, they're in when they're in cryptocurrency is that you have to be, you, know, you, have, to, you have to have extra awareness of your own personal security posture when you are dealing with crypto. Um, it, there isn't the, the, the insurance policy that you can fall back on as a consumer that, oh, I can be careless with my credit card. I can be careless <laughs> with my, my banking credentials because someone's gonna give me my money back, right? In crypto, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your hardware wallet or your wallet in general gets compromised, it's gone, right? There, there's, no one, it. There's, no one, there's no one to call to get, them, to get it back. Right, and so that's so that's the real paradigm shift, and I think um, it's a great thing, right, for people to to be their own bank, um, mm -hmm. but to be your own bank and not pay attention to your own personal security posture could be extremely dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So you have to do both. You, you <laughs> if you're going to be your own bank, you've got to be your own security as well. <laughs> you do, yeah. And, 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 or provide you your own security. The, yeah, you have to figure out what that balance is, right? Yeah. You don't have to go to the extremes, right? The tinfoil hat sort of world um, to protect your own crypto. <laughs> um, you don't have to go to the extremes so that you can't live your life. You have to be locked in a closet in your basement, um, you know, with your, you know, guarding your, guarding your hardware wallet. Um, you don't have to go to those types of extremes. Um, right. but, um, but you need to find what that balance is so that you can, one, live your life. You can, you know, invest in crypto. You can spend crypto. Um, and you could also, um, you can be safe while doing so. Um, so let me, let me take one from Justin in the audience here. Um, once in cold storage, is a human involved in the process of removing Bitcoin from cold storage or is this uh, programmatic? And um, what are the steps related to cold storage security? 
Good yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think, you know, in general, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with your own crypto, right, you have your own bank um, uh -huh. and, 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 and you put your, your Bitcoin in cold storage, um, that basically means that it's, it's kept offline. Um, it's not kept, you know, it's not connected to a system or a computer, um, that there is a manual process to move something out of cold storage. Um, typically, you have to have a, have a human to, to, to move, um, move, move that crypto out of cold storage if you're thinking about your own personal um, personal Bitcoin, your personal crypto, um, where, um, you know, that is kept offline. It's kept in a secure place. It's kept, you know, outside your own personal everyday activities um, so that um, so that if there is a failure of security um, in your digital world or your, 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 your cybersecurity world, um, or there is a failure of physical security in your own, say, like home or apartment, say you get your apartment or your home gets, gets robbed, right, or, or burglarized, um, there isn't that risk that, um, someone could physically steal um, that hardware wallet that you're using for cold storage. Okay. Um, if if uh, one only connects to a hardware wallet to check to make sure everything is okay, and uh, you don't use it to move currency, um, the wallet is for long-term investment. So is that wallet uh, at risk to hacking since it's not in use? No, I mean, you know, if it's, if it's physically secured, um, then, then no. I mean, you know, you got to think about like the risk, right? The risk equals um, like, you know, likelihood and impact, right? Obviously the impact would be very high, right? If someone was to break into your hardware wallet. Um, but if you have physically secured that hardware wallet, um, like keep it off site in like a, you know, a vault someplace, right? Uh -huh. or, if you, um, or if you, you know, have it, you know, in a secure location, um, you know, that, that's physically isolated from, from sort of all threats, then the, then the likelihood of that being compromised is very low. Um, now there are, you know, you know, the, you know, the, you know, if you're using it for like long, long-term investments, you know, you could deposit to that hardware wallet with ever, not ever, without ever having to connect it to a computer, right? You can, you can have, you know, a, a bunch of, um, bunch, a bunch of addresses that you know, um, that you use to make deposits. When you make purchases, uh -huh. you always send it to that wallet. And, and, and you don't have to actually physically connect it to anything. You don't have to actually be in physical possession of that to see what the balance is and to make deposits. Now, to make withdrawals, of course, you need to have access to it. And that's where, you know, you need to make sure that you're, you're following, you know, security best practices when you're, when you're doing that. Um, that makes sense. Um, are, are there any groups of individuals that are more susceptible to crypto scams? Um, I would say um, from what we've seen, and this is, you know, this is what we see in sort of the day of COVID-19, COVID um, the scams that, are, um, that have been increasing um, have been around um, what I would call investment scams, right? And so uh -huh. I would say, you know, there is a website out there um, that looks very nice. Um, actually, we, we identified one um, you know, just the other day. Um, it's very well polished, looks like a legitimate um, investment institution. Um, you can find out, you can see who the people are that work there. It has a history, a fake history. It looks very polished, um, like a very, very nice website. Um, and, it, and it promises some unbelievable returns, right? You know, you know 25, 30, 40% returns on, on your investment, um, which is extremely attractive, right? You see that, you're like, wow, you know, I put $100 <laughs> in, I'm going to make 40% on that. I put $1,000. It sounds like sort of unbelievable. And it is unbelievable um, <laughs> because what they do is um, they will, you know, sort of the the methodology that they go through is they will have you, you know, create an account with them. Um, and then they'll tell you something like, um, you need to create accounts with our partner exchanges. So, you know, pick the popular exchanges out there, Kraken included. Um, they'll have their victims go and they'll create accounts uh, on those very exchanges. And then they'll say something, they'll communicate with them and say, okay, now that you've created those accounts, um, you need to um, deposit um, fiat into those accounts. Um, so that we can we can help you with your investment. So put ten thousand dollars here, ten thousand here, ten thousand here, or maybe it's hundred thousand on all of them, depending on the um, depending on the individual. Um, and then they go to the next step further and say, well, you need to you know you know buy Bitcoin with all of those. Um, and then you need to um, now we're going to have this you know it's in order to get this whole investment thing to work, uh, we need you to add these these withdrawal addresses to your accounts. Um, and then we need you to go and, um, and um, now you need to give us the credentials um, to your accounts so we can manage it for you. You don't have anything to worry about. Um, we're going to manage it for you. We're you know, a secured institution and, um, and we are going to, um, you're going to see this great return. Um, you know, they go, the person hands it over to them. You know, they, they, 
they maybe have a dashboard that shows them like what their balance is and they're making a return and they get excited. And then all of a sudden, that's it. They don't hear from them any, ever again. Um, and all of the crypto has been withdrawn, uh, withdraw, with, withdrawn from all those accounts. Um, and, um, and that's it. Um, you know, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, half a million dollars is gone. And I, you know, what, we, what we've seen, right, from, from these scams is that um, primarily the targets of these criminal groups are people over the age of 50. Yeah. Um, it's over the age of 50. It's people um, that have, um, have some liquidity, right? They have maybe, maybe they have a retirement fund or they have some, um, they have a nest egg um, that they've built up um, over the right. course of their life. And now they've retired or they're getting close to retirement. And they're thinking, well, hey, I'm getting close to retirement. I have, you know, a couple hundred thousand US dollars saved um, for my retirement. Wouldn't it be great if that was a million dollars? Wouldn't that be great if that was $2 million? Yeah. Of course it would. Um, <laughs> and so, they, and so they, they go and they fall for these, you know, 50% or 100% um, return scams. And, um, and unfortunately, all of it gets taken. Um, and so, and, and, we, and, and it's, this doesn't just happen, you know, we don't hear about this once every six months. Uh, we hear about this, you know, rather often in the industry, right? This is a, this is a, this is a growing known problem. And it seems to have spiked up, um, you know, COVID has, has, has spiked that up um, because uh -huh. people know that people have more time on their hands. People are at home. Um, they are, um, they're like sort of idle, right? When people are yeah. sitting idle, um, you know, mentally people are thinking like, what can I do? I'm bored. Oh, well, yeah. I can invest, right? And so we've seen this because there's been an increase in interest in just crypto investment in general. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's basically the, um, that's basically the thing we see um, quite often. Wow, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking though, actually. Um, so there, there are some exotic schemes out there, um, you know, a lot of them related to COVID. Uh, fake employment scams, investor coaching scams, romance scams, robocall scams, man in the middle. Um, which do you think poses the biggest uh, threat uh, post-COVID? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, the, the investment scams, like I just spoke about, are, 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 are big. Um, there's also right. these, um, these, what I would call sort of like money mule um, type scams as well, uh -huh. where um, there's, an un, there's an unbeknownst individual, um, may not know what crypto is, um, in many cases does not. Um, they get involved in some scam um, where um, the criminals say you need to create an account with, you know, this company. Um, uh -huh. With this exchange, um, you need to. Um, we're going to fund it with some some money, um, and they actually do fund it with some money, and then you need to fund it for some more money. So this is like we're putting skin in the game um, with each other, um, and then you need to. Um, we're going to deposit money here, and then you need to. You know, you know, you know basically, you're basically becoming like a a money mule or a money laundering um, agent of these criminal groups, um, and the and the people think that they're making money, right? They have no idea because there's an elaborate scam that's basically. Right. talked about sort of like to those victims and um and um and they don't even really know what crypto is they don't know you know who who kraken is they never heard of us before um they're just somebody who's you know you know desperate for um to, to make some money um and you know usually ends pretty badly for those individuals um or whatever whatever investment they put into the business um that sort of business that was set up or you know it was the fictional business that was you know that they that they're in on um they lose all of that, right? Like that's the whole, that's the whole premise. You know, I, I convince you to start a business with me. We need to put money in together. You deposit a thousand dollars. I deposit a thousand dollars. You lose access um, to the account um, or, and, and, and now, you know, I take all the money, right? And you never hear from me again. Like that's, you know, we, we see those types of things, um, you know, you know, you know, you know, we, we it happening in the industry. Um, that's, that's, that's a, that's a problem as well. I mean, these are these are like these are like confidence type scams, like you know, con man type scams um, that happen in you know where they typically would happen in person. Um, now they're happening remote, and the and the criminals have retooled themselves um, to a point where um, they're they're very efficient. I would imagine that they probably have at any given time multiple people that they're scamming um, um, to try to get that to work for them. Yeah. Is there any kind of legal liability for the the? the victims, even though they unwittingly participated in something? Yeah, I mean, Cause I guess, the only ones being scammed at the Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, right? So, so I can't really comment on that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I would, I would imagine, I think, 
um, you know, being an unknowing victim um, or an unknowing participant in something, um, you know, maybe maybe could be a good defense. I, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> okay, we won't hold you to that. We won't take our yeah. legal advice from you today. <laughs> yeah. But um, so what, what about, you know, in the wake of COVID, we have stimulus check scams, donation scams, charity scams. Um, how how should consumers av avoid these? I mean, have have we seen any of those two targeting crypto? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know when you think of like stimulus check scams, I, mean, it, I always sort of go back to even like um, tax refund scams, right? Those are you know those happen every single year, um, where um, and it's it's you know unfortunately it's sort of the, whoever's the first um, to the race um, wins, and so um, if you happen to be someone who has your personal information. Um, stolen, like like you're if you're if you're in the U.S. and you have your name, address, phone number, um, social security number, maybe someone gets a hold of like a W-2 um, from your employer. Um, there are there are groups out there that will go and they will file taxes on your behalf, or they will apply for a stimulus sure. check on your behalf um, and and put in um, you know you know information um, you know in order to receive the refunds from those um, to go in the wrong place. Right. Like, you know, it's you know, very common that, you know, you file your taxes and you say, where do you want the refund to go to? Well, you can yeah. provide you know, like a debit card number where right? you can provide, um, you know, a checking account number. And uh, and then the government will just wire the funds there. Uh, and, and then you go to file your taxes as a, as a real individual or try to get your refund. And um, and of course, right. Like that's, um, it, you know, it, it goes to the criminal group instead of you. And then you and, and, and you. He says, well, you've already received your check or you've already received your refund. Yeah. And you sort of a head scratcher, like, no, I, I always file my taxes on April 15th. What are you talking about? And sure enough, the criminal groups filed, you know, filed it yeah. for you on February 2nd. So they're quicker to the draw than you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, is there any recourse there? I mean, I know we've talked about how, you know, banks and credit cards, they'll make sure that your money is backed. Does the government do the same or do you know that? Sorry, can you? Do, do the gov does the government, I mean, how, does that get made right? I mean, certainly if, if somebody has taken your money, you need to be reimbursed for that somehow, but is that how that works on the, on the uh, when it comes to taxes? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, of course you then have to file a file of like appeal, right? You have to file yeah. a appeal with the IRS. And um, go through that whole rigmarole. Yeah. Okay. Um, how has um, has COVID uh, impacted social engineering attacks? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, from what I've from what I've seen and what we've seen, you know, um, phishing attacks specifically. You know, when you talk about you know that aspect of social engineering, um, you know, there is there has been a real spike to the, to those, right? You know, it's you know people know again that people are people are idle, um, people are at home, people are um, you know online more, um, you know, as before they you know. In, you know, in pre-COVID, you know, obviously people were online, um, but there's lots of people who are sitting in front of their computers for long hours of the day. Um, they have yeah. family members who are sitting in front of their computers for long hours of the day. Right. right? No longer commuting. They're no longer in a more of a physical workplace where they are, you know, walking here, walking there. They're literally their entire life um, are is sitting, um, sitting, you know, you know, you know, just right in front of their computer. So, mm -hmm. um, phishing attacks. Um, are, are, are have spiked. Um, we saw that we, we saw this spike um, yeah, probably around you know March April time frame. Yeah, um, we started seeing an uptick um, to where even even from our perspective, even like people targeting Kraken clients, right? We started seeing um, you know more and more fake websites, fake wishing phishing websites, fake scam websites. Um, you know, again, you know. You know those those types of um, you know too good to be true type scenarios. Right. Um, we see scam websites pop up that says says things like sent you know you know here's a QR code here's our here's our Bitcoin address and it has Kraken's logo looks really nice and it says um, send us up, you know send us up to five Bitcoin and we will um, send you back um, up to ten Bitcoin plus a forty five percent bonus right like unbelievable you know like but people <laughs> right. fall victim to those um, you know you know just like you know when Elon Musk and some of the other, you know, well-known people on Twitter were, were tweeting. I was you know, going to say, that's send, reminiscent. You know, send, yeah. send Bitcoin to this address, um, send Ethereum to this address, and I will respond, um, you know, with, a, you know, I'll, I'll double your money, right? Like, people fell victim to that, right? You know, yeah. it was reported that, you know, you know a few hundred that thousand just... dollars was submitted to those addresses. So, so I mean, that's, um, you know, 
those types of things exist and the criminal groups will continually do those um, you know, in, during COVID, COVID and even post COVID because yeah. they work, right? Like there, it, you gotta imagine like sometimes yeah. you think like, well, who would fall for that? Well, there are <laughs> right. people who fall for, yeah, there are people who fall for those scams and they work. And that's why the criminal groups will continuously um, replicate those. And, and there's copycats that will continuously try um, because it doesn't cost much. It doesn't right. cost much to spin up a, you know, a website, you know, with some, with a single web page on it. Um, and, 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 and hope someone finds it um, or so, hope someone you, you spread it around on social media and hope you get a couple victims. You know, if someone sends you one Bitcoin, it's probably worth it. Yeah, that overhead's low, right? So yeah. um, yeah. I, I, I'm just going to jump in with this one and then we'll get back to some of the vulnerabilities. Um, how, how will Wyoming's new bank charter change uh, its approach to client security? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, you know, the Wyoming Bank Charter, um, you know, that is, is, a, is a, us getting, a, getting into, um, you know, the, the regular, banking regular, regulated space, right? So uh -huh. as you might imagine, um, you know, the regulated space, um, you know, has, has a, the regulations have a whole list of all these things you should be doing um, from a security point of view. Now, um, you know, we have been a security minded company since the beginning. Um, we have, you know, you know, baseline security controls and advanced security controls um, and, um, and a whole program built out to meet, and, you know, to meet all of the things that we see from a threat perspective, um, you know, in our world, right? So, um, so, so, so that was already established. Whether or not Wyoming, you know, you know, you know is, is, is something that we're, we, were doing, we were doing or not, um, we were hitting on all those cylinders, right? We have to as an exchange. And so, um, you know, the thing that will, the approach that I think will, will, will change or, or is changing for us um, is that um, now that we have, you know, our established program and comparing that to what, you know, say the state of Wyoming is saying for the, for the crack and financial side of things, um, there may be some things that we need to tweak or adjust um, in order to meet, um, meet those regulations. But, you know, obviously I've seen what those are. I, you know, my team has seen what those are. Um, and, but for the most part, um, we, we meet or well exceed um, what those requirements are already. Um, so from a client security point of view, um, I don't see that as being a massive impact um, to us, um, and it won't be. Um, it will be, it'll be something that um, we maybe even be able to push, um, you know, push the regulators um, when they see like, oh, you know, Kraken has the ability to do X, Y, and Z. Um, we're only asking for X. Well, maybe that will change the regulations and push the envelope there. And that often does, right? In any regulated okay. space, regulators are going to ask for what they think sort of like, sort of like the best, um, the best reasonable controls they can ask for. Um, and if they see the industry or the people that they're, they're, they're auditing or they're, or they're regulating um, are consistently exceeding those, well, now that's a perfect time to sort of raise the bar. Um, and so, um, so I would say in most cases, we are meeting or exceeding those requirements, um, more often exceeding those requirements um, from, a, from, a, from a security requirements per stand, standpoint. Okay, I um, want to just uh, a couple of quick questions um, about hygiene and then um, get back to some of these other issues. Um, government websites are stressing the need for phone uh, hygiene and home network organization. Are these practices enough in your estimation? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we often, you know, this is, you know, give you a glimpse of the things that we do, you know, within Kraken, you know, all of our employees um, go through an extensive, um, you know, upon, upon starting the company, and then there's continuous sort of learning along the way, but upon starting at Kraken, um, we take people through um, an extensive um, personal security training, right? So it's, it's all about their own personal security, their own personal security hygiene. Um, there's a class on it, there's a guidebook, there's a checklist, um, very different than I think most companies do. Um, and um, because um, we see it as a, you know, a really um, big importance that, um, that a person's personal home network, their personal mobile devices, their personal devices, the security around all of that um, could end up bleeding over and impacting um, the security of Kraken, right? We, we know that to be true. Um, and so um, we go through and we actually um, you know, you know, put together all of those, 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 those recommendations um, we talk about taking a balanced approach to that. You know, obviously we have a hundred things on the checklist. Um, some people's lives may not work for all hundred things, right? That are on that checklist. They may not be able to do those things depending on their personal situation. Um, but um, well, I guess what I would say there is going back to like the, um, 
going back to like making sure you focus on the basics is extremely important, right? The government, you know, government websites or the government, re, you know, recommendations, they typically just talk about best practices, right? Making sure that you keep your mobile device up to date, make sure you have a strong passcode on that mobile device, right? Make sure you're keeping your personal computer up to date, make sure you have a strong password, use, you know, full disk encryption, right? Like all the security controls that are available to you um, in your own personal life and in your, your personal world, it's to your advantage to take advantage to, to utilize those. Um, you know, I think most people, you know, it, all you have to do is sit down and say, okay, well, I have um, an iPhone and I have a MacBook. What are the things that are built in from a security point of view um, that I can take advantage of? Um, and, um, and you, know, you know, meeting those, um, you know, is far better than what most people do. And in, in, in most people that are, you know, that are, you know, in, in sort of in your space, right, in your in, in your world. Um, so, so I would say, you know, yes, government websites give you sort of, you know, bare minimum tips and tricks um, in order to follow. And I think it's probably good advice. But there's a lot of things that you can do yourself, um, you know, by just sort of just taking a step back and thinking about, you know, what do I have? What are the things that I have that could be compromised? in my world, maybe it is a hardware wallet, maybe it is my home network, maybe it is my mobile device or my home computer, um, what things can I do that maybe I'm just not doing from a hygiene perspective, like you said, um, you know, just like you brush your teeth every day and you, you shower, right? So, you know, what are some things I should be doing, like keep having strong passwords, having two-factor authentication on all the accounts everywhere, especially things like your email account, um, and, and then making sure that you're, you're patching um, your software and your, and your operating systems. Um, you know, as, as those things are made available. That's kind of a tough one. People don't, aren't so good at patching. Companies aren't so good at patching sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's far, I mean, the companies is a different world, right? Because you have like lots of dependencies that, that, that depend on various systems. And sometimes you have one, one system that maybe needs to be patched, but if you patch it, 15 others break, right? So businesses have a different problem that they have to deal with. Um, but in your personal world, it's, it's typically very easy for you to say, I'm going to update my phone today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a calendar reminder once a month on a Saturday morning and just say it's, you know, you know while I'm having breakfast, I'm going to update my devices, set them all to update in front of you. And 45 minutes later, or maybe even less, um, everything's updated. Yeah. And you're, you're protected. Yeah. Um, how, how did you and the team keep up with the huge growth and scale Kraken went through in the last uh, years? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot has to do with um, one people, right? We, we, we've, we've, we've hired a number of people over the years. Um, you know, we have, you know, we have, we've grown quite significantly from a size perspective um, to try to keep up with that. Um, a lot of it, you know, you know, I would say in the, in the recent years has to do with, um, has to do with um, scalability of, of, of our backend tooling, um, automation, um, you know, building a lot into automation, automating um, tasks um, so that we don't need 50 people to do something. Um, you maybe need five people. Um, to do something. And so a lot of that, a lot of that investing in, in technology, investing in automation, investing in um, engineering um, to be able to build those solutions um, that are um, that are thought of or or driven by our product teams um, is extremely important. Um, you know, if you if you just sort of stick with the status quo and you say, well, we built this exchange, you know, several years ago, it's just, you know, it's going to stay the same forever. Um, we're not going to invest in backend system, backend technology. We're not going to invest in our client experience. Well, well then, you know, you really can't keep up with that demand. Um, and we have this, this model of essentially constant improvement um, here at Kraken um, within, within our teams to where, um, you know, everybody has a vision. Every, you know, we have, a, we have a place we want to take um, various aspects of our solutions, of various, various products, um, and we continuously evolve that. You know, you know every couple of weeks, we're, 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 we're producing um, or releasing um, new updates um, to, to, to things that our clients see. Um, and every couple of weeks, we're releasing updates to things that our clients don't see, right? That are behind the scenes to make us more right. efficient and, and, and allow us to scale. Um, well, Kraken just added Security Shield, right? Uh, yeah. So that's a suite of new features for account security. Can you tell us about those features and the strategy that it inspired them? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, for a long time, um, I've wanted to bring um, tools to our clients um, that provide them one guidance on, on what they should be doing um, to secure their their Kraken accounts um, outside of just like a support article, right? Like or a video, you know, you know, outside right. something that's built into our platform. I also wanted to provide our clients with better visibility um, into the activity um, that's going on within their accounts. Um, you know, as far as from a login perspective, um, from a sign-in perspective, from a 
from a session perspective and from devices. Uh, and then we also know that um, phishing happens, right? We know that, you know, you know people, you know, absent all of that, we know, we, we know there are people that will have um, a Kraken account that will have a reused password. They won't have 2FA on their account um, and, they won't, and, they, and they won't pay attention to, you know, you know to the activity that's happening. Um, in their account. And so we have a long um, roadmap of, of security features and putting them putting more power into our users' hands um, and giving our users more visibility into their account so that they can actually identify um, you know, issues that may be going on um, in their account themselves um, and, be, and be alerted to things. And so the security shield is the first was the first foray into that, um, where right front and center when you log into Kraken.com, um, if you if you have an account that has none of our security features turned on, you will see a pulsing um, red security shield, right? So we have a security shield on my, on my hoodie here. Um, you'll see a pulsing red security shield, and then you click into that, and it gives you, brings you into a checkup um, you know, process where you could actually go and turn on our security features, and it tells you more about it, links you to places to learn even more about that, um, gives you tips, um, and you can go through and you can enable all of the features. Um, and now, th then, th then the, the thing, you know, the, 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 certain, the, the feature that we just released um, this week, you know, along with that is also um, device and session management. Um, we've also always done device and session management sort of behind the scenes, um, but it was never exposed um, to our clients and, um, and be able to, to show our clients, well, you have these sessions, you know, logged into your account. Um, this is the device. Here's the device type. Here's the IP address. Here's the location. Um, here is, um, you know, from a device perspective, here are devices that you've approved um, to have access to your account. Um, we know that that will eliminate a good majority of the phishing um, that our clients currently see. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's not the end of it. It's not the end of the road. Um, we know that this is, a, this is a journey. We know that this is um, something that we have um, to keep evolving. Um, and we have lots of features on the roadmap that are going to be released in the, you know, the next you know, three, four, five um, releases um, that will have, um, will even raise the bar even higher. Be, be more, be, give, give users more control. Um, things like adding a backup 2FA to their account. Um, well, you know, people often ask about FIDO2. Um, that is on the roadmap and that is coming. Um, it's coming, you know, not in like two years, but it, it is coming in a, in, a, in a shorter period of time um, so that um, we can get to that level for our clients that want to be able to log in maybe with their, their Trezor device or their Ledger device or a YubiKey. Um, and so, so that, is, that is on the horizon um, and to, to constantly improve and give the people the ability to do, um, do things um, you know, to, to take their own personal security posture and say, I want to apply these security controls um, to my account and be able to do that. Now, further down, you know, I've you know, helped build security products in, in, in the past. Um, and so I'm taking, once we, once we get to that level of, you know, giving users sort of the more baseline um, security controls um, that they can, they, can, they can manage their own world, you know, I have on the roadmap or the vision to be able to give um, give even more control or give in, put even more features into the hands of our, our users that sort of mirror um, you know, traditional security technology. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into more details on what that is, but um, there, is, there, is, <laughs> there are things on the drawing board um, that we wanna we want to get to once we get past um, um, some of the, the first round of improvements that we're making over the next um, you know, two to three months. Okay, well, Ed in the audience wants to know uh, if you can give some detail uh, perhaps on uh, lesser known security best practices and procedures. Yeah, so I guess lesser known. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think you know you have your you have your basics um, that you that you need to you know, pay pay attention to. Um, we talked about you know passwords. I, I would say like you know sort of the three P's is sort of passwords patching and then you know privacy and security settings um, in the various various services that you use. So those are sort of like. If you, if you take care of those, um, you're going to be, be okay against the vast majority of the threats that you would see as, a, as an individual user. Um, now I would say, um, you know, the lesser known um, type security controls, um, if you happen to, you know, look, use, you know, use various email accounts, if you happen to use, um, you know, you know, use various services um, that allow you to enable additional alerting, um, you know, on your accounts when certain actions happen, you know, take advantage of those. Uh, because you know what we often see is that someone's account will be compromised. Um, you know whether it's their email account or it's their own finan you know, financial account or an exchange account. Um, what will then happen is um, they won't know about it, right? They won't know that that activity is happening. So you know if there is sort of the opt-in sort of get alerts when you know things happen, 
if, especially if it's something you don't use very often, it could be a, it could be a saving grace to, to get that alert, to see that, see that notification and say, well, wait, something's up. You know, someone just, you know, logged into my account. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we added, you know, device authentication for our own clients is that if someone was to get your username and password and, and maybe your, your, your 2FA, right? Like they fished you, um, you're going to get that notification that someone's trying to log into your account um, and, and be able to see that and get more visibility. Um, so there's, there's those pieces. I would say when you're thinking about like your own personal space, if you're mm -hmm. trying to fortify your own home um, or the, or the or your home office, um, there are things that you can do. Um, you know, you can, you can, you know, make sure that you have locks on your doors um, that are not, you know, easily pickable um, or bumpable, right? If you, if you Google search around like lock picking and, and bumping, um, there are some pretty standard locks that, that, you know, most apartment, you know, you know, landlords or even builders, when you buy a brand new house or you move into a brand new house, um, you know, have like these cheap locks that really anybody can get past. So looking at that, try to you know, up, upgrade the locks on your home. Um, there's also, if you happen to live in a place that you can apply, um, uh, you, know, you know, security to like your windows on your home, you know, you can, you can Google search for, for things like window security, um, so, you know, window security film. Um, and um, you can get those things applied um, so that it buys you time, right? Like if you think about in your world, you know, in, in, in your threat, you live in a place where there's lots of break-ins. Well, if you have windows that people can just smash um, and get in really quickly by putting things like window security film in place, um, that allows you to buy yourself some time, right? You know, a lot of criminals just want to get in and out quickly. They don't want to hang out for a while, right? Or they don't want to make a lot of noise. And so by putting things like window security film in place, a criminal goes and they, you know, with a rock and they try to break your window, uh, it doesn't break right away. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't shatter. Right. Um, it takes four or five, sometimes if you, you know, watch a YouTube video on it, you can see it takes 20 hits for someone to break through a window. By that time, maybe there's attention has been drawn, like your, the neighbors have heard or somebody's seen them and, um, and they, they typically don't want to stick around. Um, so those are, those are things that people can do in like the personal physical space. Okay, um, I have a question about, uh, since I have you here, um, ethical hacking. <laughs> um, I'm interested uh, in, in how that has changed um, over the, the, I guess for the ethical hackers over the last few years and has, has uh, COVID had any effect on that? Well, I mean, I th you know, we have, you know, our own team of hackers, um, you know, here in, here, here within Kraken, um, we have our own red team. Um, we also have Kraken Security Labs um, that does research, security research. And um, I would say, I'm, I'm not really sure it's changed much during COVID. Um, you know, I think, you know, the types of things that they may be utilizing, um, the campaigns that they create, when you're thinking about a red team within a company, um, you know, you know, emulating some of the scams, emulating some of the attacks, that um, organizations are seeing more, right? Like the phishing attacks or the social engineering attacks that have spiked um, is probably something that, you know, you know red teams and, and, and penetration testing teams in general are, are trying to emulate more. Um, I would say that's probably the only real shift there. Um, you know, it's, you know, again, as a, as a red teamer, uh, you have the, um, you have the, it, often you'll have the luxury of sort of time on your side um, to sort of play the long game. And so you can, you can see like, is there a new thing that has changed within a company? Um, is a company that was more of a brick and mortar company, a completely, you know, a remote company today? Um, and do they have remote workers um, working from home? And so you can think about that as a, as a, as someone who's planning out a campaign and can do things more of like, oh, well, we're doing, you know, send an email to all, all a bunch of employees that says, um, there's going to be a Zoom upgrade. You need to, you need to visit this website and it's, you know, Zoom upgrade, Zoom dash upgrade dot, you know, US or something, right? You need to go to this website. You need to download this new Zoom upgrade and you send it to all the employees at a company. Uh, now, you're probably not going to get everybody to fall for it, but you probably will get a handful of them. Um, and if that Zoom upgrade is a, is a, you know, is a piece of malware or a backdoor, um, you know, it's a rat maybe even, um, that allows you to remote control that employee's computer that's working from home. Well, you know, now you've, you've gained access to not only that employee's computer, probably their home network, and if they're yeah. VPNed into the, corporate, into the company network, you now have access potentially to the company network. So, you know, it really, I think the one thing that's maybe changed from a COVID perspective is sort of the creativity that people can use yeah. um, where maybe that was something wasn't normal for, for, for IT groups or, or things that happen from a communication standpoint, but now it is normal um, because companies have had to pivot and, 
and, and, and use new, new techniques and new tools um, in order to, um, to get their workforce that was used to walking around offices and, and asking for help um, to be able to you know, scale and be able to help people you know, that are working out of their homes. Okay. We've talked about like government guidance uh, and the like, but where, uh, what are some really good sites where uh, people can, can get information? Yeah, I mean, well, maybe SC Magazine is probably, a, <laughs> a, a, SC Media is, a, is, a, is a great place, right? You, have, you guys have lots of good articles about, you know, sort of trends that are happening. Um, what, I mean, one of the things that I use, I mean, I use, I use Twitter quite often. Um, you know, it's sort of, you know, in, in my world, um, I want to see what's happening. I want to see what the chatter is um, that's going on. Um, you know, you know that is that is a really really good tool. If you just follow things like pounds, you know, you know hashtag security, right? You you follow follow that, um, and you see what the chatter is going on going on, and you follow some of the you know more of the industry leaders, a lot of the you know executives or more like CTOs at various um, crypto companies and right. security companies. Um, you'll see. You know, you know, new threats. You'll see things about new zero days um, that are that are that are out in the wild um, pretty quickly, um, even before an article gets written, right? And even you probably know, right? Like a lot of times things break and they go out, and an article gets written. So That's as right. someone who's like trying to stay the pulse, you know, you know, and, and, and you know, you have to be, you have to be careful there, right? Because there's 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 misinformation, there's false reports of things that happen sort of in um, in social media quite often. Um, uh -huh. But you might get you might see something quickly there and can say like, let me dig into that. And then you see an article written, right, about it, or you see a government advisory, right? You 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 go to you know you see a government advisory or a just advisory in general about some threat, um, and so um, so it's sort of like the early warning pulse. Um, I usually take use Twitter for that um, to be able to to be able to learn and see what's happening, right? Um, what's going on? What's the chatter about? Is there something new happening? Um, is there a, a new data breach? Is there something new that's popping up? And, Use it as sort of the pulse, um, while then you know going to more of the traditional places to to see sort of maybe in many cases sort of like the balanced view on actually what's the reality and what's happening. Yeah, and some detail. Um, some detail as well, yes. Yeah. So um, we started off uh, talking about um, the similarities between your previous uh, experience and your time at at Kraken and how you know your life sort of led you to this. Um, yeah. But we have an audience member who wants to know what things are different. <laughs> so what things are different, um, like at Kraken, I guess maybe. Um, oh, and yeah. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think you know the one thing that I you know has been like probably the breath of fresh air being in the security industry for a very long time is there's often this I mean, there's often this notion within companies that the security team is are the only people that actually care about security. Right, like mm -hmm. that, that happens in many companies, right? It's sort of the security team is just, you know, out there to find problems to tell people to fix things. And then everybody's like, yeah, 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 we'll get to that later, right? Um, what's different at Kraken is that uh, this organization, you know, is, was, was born um, out of, you know, the notion of, of, of building a secure exchange, right? From, from, from day one, right? This was not an afterthought. It wasn't, we were operating for five years and we thought, hey, wait, we better get into this, get on the security thing, right? Like that didn't happen here. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a breath of fresh air. Um, the other aspect of it is that all of our employees is what, what I would sort of classify as, is productively paranoid. Right? <laughs> you know, so productively paranoid means um, you know, where in many companies, people just blindly go and they do their job and they click on links and they open things and they just, they just sort of follow um, in the sort of like monotonous path of getting their task done. Uh, you know, all the employees at Kraken um, will, will we'll pause and they will stop and they will stop to think, well, you know, there's this thing that I'm being asked to do. I wasn't asked to do this yesterday. What is this? Um, I, or this, or someone asked me to do something. I have this email from somebody. I don't know who this person is. Um, it's not as if I just go and just, oh yeah, sure. I'll follow along. I'll install whatever you want, or I'll click this link and I'll, 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 I'll put this information in on this website. Like people don't do that here at Kraken, right? We don't, we, you know, right. From, from from all levels, right, from the executive level, um, you know, you know, to every organization within the you know team and within the company, um, it is a very security minded organization. To where um, we would rather not do something, right? We would not, rather not put out a release or do something, um, you know, if it if it's going to impact um, the security of the company. Uh, and people know that. I mean, if it means that it's going to take an, a day longer, if it means it's going to take a, a month longer to do something, um, to do it in a secure way versus a just sort of you know, you know, security afterthought kind of way where you just like, let's just do it and we'll worry about security later. Um, the company always chooses um, the, um, the secure path. 
Um, and that's, that's built into our, our culture, that's built into our, our DNA. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's really a breath of fresh air compared to previous places um, where I've been, where, um, where I've been advising or consulting or learning more about companies. Um, you know, when I would do assessments or tests or investigations, that was not the case. It was very much the security team sort of looking to me or looking to the investor and say, you know, we've been talking about this for two years. You know, we, can, we can't get the business to do X. We've been talking about, you know, trying to increase password length. And the business says, you know, our, our, our employees, you know, can't be bothered with passwords greater than seven characters, right? Like those kind of like, you know, things that if you're a security person, you're like, you know, it's sort of mind boggling that people would still operate that way. Um, but, um, but that's not the case here, right? You know, when, when we want to make security improvements, when we want to do things to, when we identify, you know, gaps um, or ways to improve this constant improvement, and we roll things out, um, you know, very, you know, we're, we're, we're typically applauded or, 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 um, or, or, or welcomed with open arms um, from the business, um, which, is, which is rare, which is a very rare, rare thing in, in, in business. It's a very rare thing in the, in the world that we live in. Yeah, well, that could be a, a, a blueprint for um, all the companies out there. And that, that's actually a very good place to leave this. Um, and, you know, I, it's, uh, we're, we're at the end of our time. And uh, this has uh, been a great discussion. Nick, thank you uh, so much. Um, it's been my pleasure to speak with you again. And to everyone out there, um, the COVID pandemic <laughs> doesn't seem to be going any place for a while and neither do the criminals. So um, please remember, you know, that um, you're going to have to take security into your own hands and there's plenty of help out there. Look at Kraken. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us here uh, today and uh, wish you uh, good health and security. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It was great chatting with you again, Terry. Wonderful.